following program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. WMAR-TV and Heaven 600 present Grace and Glory. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory, and number one because of you. So let us pause for just a second and say thank you for the support that you've given us for so many years. Lee Michaels here. And as always, we look forward to inspiring and encouraging you to start your morning and empower you. Got some great information to share with you. We'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. But as always is the case, we get started with the word. So let's make our way to Southern Baptist and Bishop Dante Hickman, who awaits us there with a message from on high from the Southern Baptist Church on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. The book of Psalms is a song book that reflects the journey of the psalmist as well as the people of God in their journey with God. It is a powerful and permeating book of songs that enable us to get through some of the toughest times of our lives. There are different types of psalms in the collection of 150. There are psalms of wisdom, psalms of thanksgiving, psalms of lament, royal psalms, and then there are psalms of praise. Psalm 27 is viewed as both a psalm of lament and a psalm of thanksgiving. Some scholars say that two parts of the psalms are so different that they seem to be different psalms altogether. That is to say, Psalm 27 should be separated and broken up. Nevertheless, it is my contention that there is one writer who exposes two different emotional experiences about life. And throughout the psalm, he talks to himself and he talks to God while going through his troubles. And then he finally speaks to those of us who would listen. We love to read this particular psalm for its poetic rhetoric of the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemy, comes upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. And though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that that will I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. It sounds poetic and it sounds pretty, but the psalmist, my dear brothers and sisters, is dealing with the anguish and the anxiety of his life. There are heavy matters weighing upon him that necessitate a desperate cry for the help of God. He really demonstrates for us that being a child of God does not exempt us from the hard, harsh, and hostile realities of life. Simply put, you can't be blessed without having some burden sometime. You can't be favored without getting frustrated sometime. You can't be anointed without being aggravated sometime. And surely you can't be a saint and not sin sometime. Whatever you do, don't listen to those people that act like they ain't struggling with, with nothing. Don't ever believe the people who fake the funk like they don't ever mess up, like they don't ever deal with anything that is wrong in their lives. All of us every day have a struggle in our flesh, have a struggle in our mind, have a struggle in our finances and in our family. And if you're not dealing with anything, keep on living, something is on the way. <laughs> The psalmist in this text was honest, at least, about his reality. He knew who God was, and he had a personal relationship with God for himself. And throughout this psalm and his experience, he maintained a strong prayer life. And I need you to note 
that his prayers were not filled with all pleasantries and with pretty vernacular. No, when you read this psalm and others like it, he kept it real in his prayers. See, wherever you keep it real, it ought not just merely be before people who really don't care about your condition, but you ought to keep it real when you talk to God about your situation. I believe that in prayer you can find some of the best mental, emotional, and psychological therapy that you could ever find. Whenever you read the psalmist's prayers, you knew exactly where he was emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. He teaches us that prayer is so critical that we ought to be clear about where we are and what we need when we pray. Our prayers can't always be pretty. Sometimes you got to go to God straight up and say, look, I'm broke and I don't know why. (laughs) I'm sick and I'm trying to feel better. You told me to love somebody that I just can't stand right now. I'm having a hard time and you told me things will be different by now. Because God can handle that kind of prayer. He can handle all of your feelings without you acting like you got it all together. So you're sitting next to people today who are praising God like ain't nothing wrong. But if the the movie scroll, scroll with the movie script were or real would roll on their lives, you would see that all hell is breaking loose and they need to talk to somebody about it. Subsequently, towards the end of this psalm, the psalmist reflects on his reality, and this is what he surmises. He says, I would have fainted unless I would have believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says, straight up, Dante, I almost gave up. He says, and I'm a living testimony that it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how how spiritual you are. It doesn't matter how many scripture verses you can quote. Everybody feels like giving up sometime. And the real key in life is knowing why you feel that way when you feel it. The psalmist demonstrates in the text that a lot of us give up on God and we give up on life because of the process that we must endure. Let the church say process. Read throughout Psalm 27 and you'll note that he goes through a roller coaster of emotions. He goes from trust when he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? But then he moves from trust to trepidation. He says, I've got some enemies in my life that are coming upon me to eat up my flesh. Whatever you do, God, please do not allow the will of my enemies to take over my life because false witnesses have risen up against me and those who breathe out cruelty. He moves from trepidation to thanksgiving when he says, but you have been my help. And every time I turn around, you bring me out of one situation or another. And then he finalizes that thing by saying, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He tells us, my dear brothers and sisters, essentially, that life is a process where you'll go through some ups and some downs, some highs and some lows, some mountains and some valleys but in the final analysis all you can do is wait on the Lord. Somebody shout wait on the Lord. I know God has given you a word that everything is going to be all right, but you need to know in life things will not happen when you want them to happen and all you can do is mark time and just wait on God to turn some stuff around. Just the other day I was meeting with a developer and at the end of our meeting I said you know after 15 years of being in the development process I have learned that there's some things that I want to happen that need to happen that don't always happen when I want them to happen and I just got to wait for it to happen he said you know what pastor the pause makes you stronger and I said man you don't know what you just said 
said out of your mouth. I'm preaching that on Sunday because I have learned through the process of time that I may not get what I want when I want it, but through the process, God has made me stronger. He's made me wiser. He's made me better because the end result is not to get to the destination without maturation so that you can come to the end saying it was God that brought me out of my situation. Do I have a witness in the building? Somebody ought to testify. I've been growing through it all. Yeah, it's a process. And every now and then, we want to give up because the process to endure is really the process of evolution. Yeah, Paul D David says, you also want to give up because the presence of God seems so elusive and evasive in your life. What would you talk about, Pastor? It's in the text. Dave, David says, the Lord is my light and he is my salvation. But when you read down further, he starts saying, Lord, I need you to help me and I need you to be present with me. Don't you know, David, that God is a very present help in the time of trouble? He said, yeah, Dante, but I don't always feel like God is with me in every situation. Can I get some real folk in the house that can say, Pastor, sometimes I don't feel like God is with me when I'm going through some of the vicissitudes of life. It seems like I'm in this thing all by myself, but God is trying to help you to understand that if you want the intentional awareness of his presence, then you've got to be active in your prayer life. God says, I'm always there, but your flesh is trying to block me from your spirit, and the devil is playing tricks on your mind, but if you just have a little talk with Jesus and tell him about your struggles he may not take you out of the fire but he'll get with you in the fire and you'll know that everything <laughs> is working out all right the Bible says we want to give up because of the process we want to give up because we don't always feel his presence and then we want to give up we want to give up because of the persistence of our enemies. Yeah, that's what the psalmist says. He says, every time I turn around, God defends one enemy or defeats one enemy, but then another enemy rises up in their place. He said, Dante, it gets worse than that because I got enemies in my family. He says in this same psalm, when my mother and my father forsake me. Then the Lord will take me up. Some scholars say he wrote this psalm when he was on the run from his own son Absalom who, would be, who betrayed him and tried to take the kingdom from him. Because guess what? Sometimes people in your own house will become the worst haters in your life. Yeah, your friends will become your frenemies. And if that ain't bad, he says false witnesses have risen up against me. You ain't lived through nothing until somebody just blatantly lies on you. I mean, have you ever been lied on? Have you ever been mistreated? Have you ever been talked about? Have you ever been laughed at? And then after all of that, the enemy is trying to come upon you to eat up your flesh. Can I tell you something? That you'll never be able to get rid of every enemy. You'll never be able to correct every liar. You'll never be able to get rid of every hater but here's the good news and you ought to shout off of this that although the enemy keeps coming you keep on winning <laughs> do I have a witness here somebody high five your neighbor and tell him I'm winning again every time I turn around the devil sends somebody else after me but they're just a sign that God is about to give me victory one more time because God promised that he make my enemy my footstool. That means every hater has become my elevator. Have I got a witness in here? Somebody shout, I'm going all the way up. I gotta go. He wanted to quit. Don't hang up on me. He wanted to quit. He wanted to give up. 
he wanted to throw in the towel because of the process, because of the presence of God, because of the persistence of the enemy. But I, the Bible says in the final summation that he didn't give up on God. Look at somebody, tell them whatever you do, don't give up on God. Instead, he demonstrated that your faith will anchor your expectation until your situation catches up with your revelation. I, I got a revelation of how it's going to turn out, but my situation doesn't look like my revelation. But faith holds me together and helps me to maintain my expectation until I get a manifestation of what God is going to do in my life. I need somebody to shout, I'm determined. And I'm preaching the sermon this afternoon because all of us need to know how to hang in there and to have faith in God in the meantime. Can I tell you, your faith is not necessary at the announcement of a thing. And your faith is not necessary after the thing happens. But you need faith in the meantime. In between time, between the announcement and the aftermath, when ain't nothing happening in your life, ain't nothing moving in your life, when things seem like they're dry, that's when you've got to trust God the most. Can I preach like I feel it? And if you have faith in the meantime, my Bible says you can override every option in your life. I'm preaching to some folks who are trying to take the easy way out. I'm preaching to some folk who says I'm so tired of waiting on God that I'll take second best. And some of you have ended up with the wrong husband and the wrong wife because you settled for less. Some of you have ended up with the wrong career and the wrong job because you settled for less. But if you hold on to God's changing hand. God will do what he told you he was going to do. Have I got a witness? Listen at David. He said, I would have given up unless I had believed to see. He said, stop right there. He said, Dante, I had a faith of specificity. He said, I was believing to see what God said he was going to do. He says, I wasn't believing for one thing and then said settling for another. He said, I'm not hedging my bets on God. He said, my victory is in what I'm believing God for. And everybody else can do whatever they want to do, but I'm going to stay right here. And I'm going to wait on God until God gives me what God said I could have. Because you ain't got time to have a wishy-washy faith. And at some point you got to be determined that this is my only option and if God can't do it then it won't get done somebody shout I know he can and I believe he will can I shout you right quick if life has not stopped you then you should never stop striving to see what God will do slap five with your neighbor and tell them I'm determined to see God move in my life you can sit there and act crazy if you want but I pray too much not to see God move I give too much not to see God move I preach too hard not to see God move and I shout too much not to see God move is there anybody here that's believing God to do something in your life you ought to jump up right quick and say God is about to show me something eyes have not seen and ears have not heard and neither has it entered into the hearts of people what God has prepared for them that love him can I preach like a feel it you got to look at what the devil is praying and you got to say no not you and no not you and you ain't the one but when God 
God shows up, you can stand up and say, you the one. I've been keeping my head done. I've been keeping my clothes pressed. I've been keeping myself together for. God told me what he was sending in my life. And I won't settle for less than what God has for me. Can I preach like I feel it? The Bible says when you have faith in the meantime, you can override options and you can operate with optimism. Look at the person beside you and tell them stay positive. Don't let the devil make you negative. Don't let the enemy make you pessimistic about what you're going through. Because the Bible says I would have fainted unless I believed to see. To see what, David? The goodness of the Lord. Somebody shout the goodness of the Lord. I don't care how bad it gets. I'm looking for good to show up in my life. I don't care how the city looks. I'm looking for good to show up in my life. Because I stopped by to tell you, when you have faith in God, you can't help but look for the positive. Have I got a witness here? That's why when other people drive in our communities, they see abandoned property. They see food scarcity. They see defunct school facilities. And they see criminal activity. But we see restoration and transformation. Opportunities. Because there's nothing too hard for God. Did he pick you up? Did he turn you around? Did he make a way out of no way? And if God can do it in your life, he can do it for somebody else. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them stay positive. Tell them praise God like you're losing your mind. Because what the devil meant for evil, God will turn it around for your good. I feel like shutting it down if y'all want me to shut it down just holler shut it down Dante shut it down when you got faith in the meantime you can overcome before it's over all of y'all ain't gotta shout but I dare you to look down your road and shout it ain't over it ain't over it ain't over I know you're broke right now but it ain't over I know you're lonely but it ain't over I know things have not worked out the way you want them to work out but it ain't over look at what David said I would have quit unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord not when I die not in heaven not in the sweet by and by but in the land of the living somebody help me preach and shout he's gonna bless me while I'm alive he's gonna keep me while I'm alive he's gonna make a way while I'm alive I feel like crazy now cause you know why some of y'all can't shout cause your enemies are still alive well the good news is you still alive after everything the devil tried he tried to kill you he tried to get your peace he tried to steal your joy but somebody shout out of everything I've been through I'm still here still got my mind still got my praise still got my shout still got my dance still got my holler somebody shout still got it 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 and this joy that I have the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away and God said I'ma let your haters stay alive long enough to see you blessed cause he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies somebody ought to shout somebody ought to holler Somebody ought to scream. Somebody ought to praise him. Lift up your hands. Throw back your head and shout hallelujah. Anyhow, yes! Won't go fix it for you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Hasn't he done it? Say yes! Yeah. Say yes! Yeah.
God, something's about to happen. I don't know what you've been waiting on, but you need to claim it right now. Something is about to happen for me. Something good, something good. I said something good. Grab somebody, tell them something good is about to happen in your life. You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566. Join Pastor Hickman and Southern Baptist Church for any of our five worship experiences, 7.15 a.m., 9.45 a.m., and 12 p.m. at our Baltimore location, 1701 North Chester Street, 8.45 a.m., at our Hartford County location, Aberdeen High School, 251 Paradise Road, Aberdeen, Maryland, and 11 a.m. at our Howard County location, Howard High School, 8700 Old Annapolis Road, Ellicott City, Maryland. Visit our online community at southernbaptistchurch.org and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Be sure to join us each week at Southern Baptist Church. Welcome back to Grace and Glory. Thank you, Dr. Hickman or Bishop Hickman for uh, that uh, aspiring word. Right now we want to turn our attention to our guest, a good friend, uh, Bishop James Nelson, who I haven't seen in a while. I got to get him on the show in order to get to see him. <laughs> Man, how have you been? I'm doing quite well. I see you, quite... you, you, you're doing your thing there. Trying to do a little something. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see how long we can keep it. <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. Well, it's becoming. Listen, uh, I'm excited. I hear um, there's some very positive um, news coming out of your camp, and particularly something that you had a vision and a uh, seeded that's going to be taking place real soon. Yes, it's it's uh, something I'm so excited about. It's called Be More Now. Okay. Um, it's happening on October the 12th, mm -hmm. and it's it's a citywide event that has been uh, birthed. And here's the here's the thought behind it. It's a collaboration between the spiritual and the social that's good. to empower the city with new hope, bring passion, reframe what has been. Uh, of course, you know that from D.C. they spoke about how deplorable our city is. Yeah, but they, what but, do they know? But we're getting ready to repackage and, and show that Baltimore has more to offer than what people believe. You know, the one good thing that came out of those derogatory comments is that good people in this city who understand and appreciate and love this city were st spurred to action. Absolutely. And so so what seated in you was this vision, Baltimore Now. So why Baltimore Now? Where, where did the name come from? The name came from just the concept that there is more to Baltimore than what we, we see. You better tell And me. that now it's time to put a demand on that that extra potential, that, that potential energy that's just sitting there, uh -huh. it's time to put a demand on it so that we can be everything that we have been predestined and and um, predestined and, and called out to be. And so I'm just one of the many voices that are coming together to say, hey, let's do it now. It's good. Let's do it now. Baltimore yeah. now. Absolutely. Makes sense. I like the fact that you use the term energy to explain it because I, I was, had a conversation with someone recently and I said that what needs to happen is there needs to be a change of energy in the city. Because Absolutely. right now uh, the, the city has been under the influence of the wrong kind of energy. I agree. I, I agree. When you look at the murder rate, when you look at the economic disparity, when you look at the challenges that we're having, it's time for us to recreate, re-energize yeah, the re city of Baltimore. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. the only thing you can do that is we have to do something different in order to make it happen. So this will be different on the 12th? Absolutely. Saturday the 12th. Now this is a whole day event, right? Oh yeah, it's a whole day event. So here's what's happening. I'm so excited. At 9 o'clock in the morning, okay. we have a job fair. Okay. Uh, we have expungements clinic okay. for those that have had challenges with the law. And then uh, we have voter registration, even credit repair. At okay. 10 o'clock, one of our signature sponsors, which is Chase. Chase. J.P. Morgan and Chase. We're going to come back uh, to that. Okay. <laughs> and they're, they're having a, what they call a Chase currency conversation. And here's how I present it. It's a conversation for us, by us. And it's okay. going to be women on the panel. Um, uh, Ivy McGregor okay. is going to be the moderator. And it's women from our community that are talking about their own financial literacy. And then there is something that is called uh, the Chase Financial Pledge. Okay. And here's what it is. 
They just want you to make a pledge about your own financial status that you will be accountable and more um, literate financially to make sure that we succeed as an African-American people. So, so there's some stewardship there. Oh, absolutely. So how did you get Jet Chase to embrace this? When they understood the concept of what we're doing. You went to them and said, knocked on the door and said, hey, look, I got something I want you to take a look at. Listen, Chase is really for the community. Okay. And when they understood what we're trying to do as for the city of Baltimore, they had no problem backing us. And on top of that, the last thing that I didn't tell you is at 11 o'clock, Bishop Jakes is preaching. So that's 11 o'clock during the day? During the day. Oh, my goodness. So we start at 9 with the job fair, the conversation at 10. Expungement. And expungement, all that. And then we go right into um, the big event, the culmination, where we have Bishop Jakes speaks to the people. So if you, if you see it, it mirrors what the vision of Be More Now is, which is the collaboration of the spiritual and the social. Which is why you said that in the beginning. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. So at the end of the day, when the smoke clears, the crowd disperses, what would be your prayer and hope would have been accomplished? My prayer and hope is, is a couple of things. Number one, that hope is renewed, that people feel hopeful again. Okay. And, and then secondarily, um, that people walk away with jobs and, and opportunities. But third and most important, that the city of Baltimore knows that there are some people that come together that care about the city beyond political agendas. We just care about the people. Because yeah. the thing that I want to stress is, even though I may have been the one that birthed it, yeah. pastors are coming together That's from good. different denominations. Well, one plants, another waters. Yes. You know. even, even the Muslim community. That's they're, good. They're partnering with us and, and different ethnicities and cultures. Everybody's coming together for one agenda. Man, that's great. And that's to help that's the city exciting. of Baltimore. You know, and I've, I've, seen, I've seen the evolution of several outstanding, we, we mentioned before we went on, uh, about uh, one that was calling men yes. uh, to come out and have a presence at the schools. Absolutely. So, you know, in retrospect, uh, uh, maybe the comments that came out of Washington did some good. Absolutely. Absolutely, and we're and, and it's it's interesting because now people are having a sense of pride about right. the city. Right, because I know I was offended because this yes. is my home. Absolutely. So we're taking ownership, and and now what is happening is instead of being fragmented, everybody's starting to come together. That's good. And make it happen. So how can folk reach out to you, connect with you to get more information, just get on board with the event? A couple of things. They can go to my website, which is jamesnelsonministries.com. Uh -huh. It's information on there. They can go to the Be More Now Instagram, okay. and there'll be information on That's there That's Instagram? As well. okay. Yes, on okay. Instagram. Be More Now Instagram. Okay. Uh, how about a phone number, the old-fashioned way? Listen, phone number 443-438-7745. Uh, you know, some folk are still there. Yeah, some people are, are still yeah, old-fashioned. We got to bring them along. Absolutely. <laughs> but listen, man, I'm excited, and congratulations to you for embracing the challenge to give birth to such a tremendous and positive vision uh, to impact the city. I'm, every, every little bit helps. You know the old saying, inch by inch is a cinch. Absolutely. You know, and so uh, I just believe that as we continue to see these kinds of events evolve, we're going to start seeing the uh, reciprocal progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let me just say this. This is not a moment. It's a birth of a movement. I love it. Yes, sir. Man, you just said something there. Bishop, it's good to see you again. Good to man. see you too. All right, listen, we're on our way to our second spoken word. This time, Pastor Jason Clark of the Omega Baptist Church right here on Grace and Glory. Hey, it's me, Pastor Jason Clark of Omega Baptist Church Ministries, inviting you to join me every Sunday, 8 a.m., 10 a.m. at the Omega Baptist Church in Owens Mills. Come on out and have a great time with us. 44, 24 Pennington Road. You'll have a great time. God bless. The grass wasn't the flower fade, but the word of God instructs me to tell you your kindness is getting ready to come back. Your kindness is getting ready to come back. As I drove Amen off the parking lot, God, my mind brought me to 2 Samuel uh, at a time where I could remember David uh, asking God a question, what shall I do now that things have changed? Uh, how, how shall I behave myself? Uh, how shall I handle the new happenings in my life? Uh, I, I need God's instruction. I need God's direction. And somebody came here this morning under the same inquiry uh, with the same decisions to be made and God is saying to you, I have a word of instruction and direction 
for your life. Somebody say amen. In Proverbs, he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I know that there are a lot of options on the table. I know there's a lot of dilemmas that you've got to decide. But God sent me by here in this month of kindness to remind you, amen, that he is the one that wants to direct your path. Come on, Jason. For the word of God says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Y'all gonna get it all. So David said, now that all this has happened, I'm going back to God and asking God one question. God, shall I go up to any of these cities of Judah? I want to know exactly what city I've been anointed to be blessed in. I want to know the place and the space that you have anointed me to prosper in. I don't want to go where you did not sin. I don't want to be where you will not be with me. I'm asking you, God, to show me the city. Show me the way. I want to know, can I have permission to go up? Somebody in here ought to just be praying for God's presence and his permission. Is it your time to go up? And, and I like this. I like this, Vanessa, because God gives him a simple response uh, to a major prayer. Y'all don't like this stuff. So now, he, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time. That's why I love God. We can give God a, a $2 million prayer, and he can answer us uh, in two cents. He, he, he doesn't have to say a whole lot. All, all he has to say is healed. Uh, all he has to say is blessed. All, all God has to say is go up, and that's all you need to get. You don't need to spend no whole bunch of time. God said, uh, your prayer is going to be longer than my answer. Go up. Go up. And, and I like I like what David said now that I've got permission to rise, to ascend, amen, to be greater than I've been. I know I'm about to go up. Uh, hold, hold on. Wait. Because like, I, I want to be clear. I'm going up. But I want to be in the right space. I want to be in the right place. And he said, what city, uh, where shall I go? And he says, go to Hebron. Go to a humble space. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Go, 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 go to Hebron. Don't, 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 don't go to uh, 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 the major city. Go to the minor. Start small. Hebron, Hebron, Hebron. Go, go, go to a space that that'll help you to remember that I, I'm the God that can do great things with small things. See, some, some of us want to go to the great space first. God said, no, let, let, let's get you ready for it. Come on now. Let's prepare. Go to heaven. He said, go unto Hebron. And so David went up there. He took his wives, the hit on him, the judge of life, Abigail. Y'all know A and A. Uh, both of his first wives. Y'all know the last one better than B. Uh, but y'all know the two A's in the B. Y'all uh, Hinoham and Abigail, and then he got Bathsheba. Y'all, come on, talk to me here. Uh, uh, he, he, he says, I'm going to take them. And then he says, the men that were with him, David brought them up as well. You know, the men that had been with him since he was ostracized and attacked by Saul. He says, I'm willing to go as well. Now, I'm going to go with them. They, they were them that had bad credit. I need some people in here that knew what debt looked like, that knew what bad credit looked like, that knew what it was like not to have very much. I need somebody in here that can testify with me. I know what it's like to grow up without a silver spoon in my mouth. I had a, I had a spork. Y'all, where are my spork people that had to have a fork and a spoon connected to it? I need somebody in here that knows what it's like not to have the best, but to still be blessed. They brought him up his household and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron and, and the men of Judah came and, and there they anointed David king over all the house of Judah. This is interesting because they don't anoint him king in Jerusalem. They, they don't anoint him king in Shiloh. They, they don't anoint him king over all of Israel. Right now he just has a, a part 
uh, if you will, of the kingdom. He's not king over everything, but he's king of, over something. Uh, I, I, I gotta pause here and help you parenthetically to understand uh, that God has anointed you royal for right where you are. Uh, hey, hey, man, hey, I, I gotta help you here. You are anointed royal over that apartment you live in. Uh, and so even though it's not the four or five bedroom house yet, uh, you want to walk in there like God has blessed you uh, with something. Uh, he's anointed you over that chariot that you have uh, parked outside. Uh, I know it's not a Bentley yet. I know it's not a Rolls Royce yet. Uh, but you want to be glad of what God gave you uh, in your now so you can celebrate it in your next. I find out for five people that want to give God glory right here. But I need some kings uh, and some queens uh, while we're in this praise palace uh, to say I've been anointed uh, right where I am. Uh, I might be a secretary, but I'm anointed secretary. I might be an administrator, but I'm anointed because whatever my job is, I'm going to do it like I'm Lord. That when you don't see yourself as royal, people will treat you regularly. I might be anointed for something small, but my small got plenty of power. Now God says that that's where He had David. He had David in this in this humble beginning. But that that's kind of the story of David. If you know his history. He, he, he got called to fight the Goliath, amen, the Philistine giant, out of the out of the pasture, dealing with the sheep and the, and, and the lambs. Like that's kind of his story. He's always the underdog. I set y'all up. I'm sorry. I, I really apologize. I really set y'all up. That was all to set y'all up. He, he came out of nothing, so he can have an affinity and familiarity. To those that started with humble beginnings. There's something about having nothing that makes you compassionate to the people with nothing. I mean, not, not all of us, some of us, some of us we, we start out with nothing, we get something and act like we ain't never been there. You know what it's like to be broke. You, you know what it's like not to have. Yes. You know what it's like to have a lot, but have to make your lot in the pot spread to a whole lot of little bowls. Yes. Y'all ain't said anything to me. I, I know what it's like to take one cup of one bowl of soup and have to put it in three different bowls. Yes. So dad could have some. Mom could have some, y'all understand me? Boys could have some. It, it, it's something about growing up with little. My, my grandmother said to me when I graduated Morehouse, she said, just because now you can walk with kings, don't lose fellowship. Come on now, with the poppers and the poor. Some, some, of us, some of us become so, so, so high on the hall, we forget when we started out eating chips. You weren't always ready to have amen, amen, pork loin, tenderloin, and sirloin. There was a day when you just had amen ramen noodles with the pork loin flavor on it. I wish I had five of y'all that would say amen. See, see, the, see the, the thing about David is that because he came from humble beginnings, he was not angry at being anointed king in Hebron because he said to himself, I know that where you are and all of the pomp and circumstance does not matter if you don't have the Lord on your side. That if you have all the pomp and all the circumstance, all the jewelry and all of the luxury, but you don't have the Lord on your side, it means nothing. You can be called apostle, you can be called bishop, come on now, you can be called prophet, but if you don't have the presence of God, it doesn't mean nothing. Amen. That's where we are, church. Amen. We are in a place in the church where people are more concerned with title than truth. They are more concerned with appearance than anointing. And David said, because I've been humble enough to serve the sheep. I have no problem at all being anointed in a humble place. 
Bible says the men who women brought him up, they and their households dwelt in the city of Hebron. The men of Judah came and anointed him king over Judah. And they told uh, David, listen, the men of Jabesh Gilead were those that buried Saul. In other words, somebody has shown a great kindness to the house of Saul, even though Saul had been everything but kind to you. I mean, Saul was a, was a boss to have. Y'all got bad bosses. Y'all didn't have no Saul. Saul, Brenda, would throw javelins at David, trying to kill him at the dinner table. Saul was constantly trying to undermine the amen, David's strength and anointing, even though David was serving at Saul's hand. Every battle that he won was for the benefit of Saul. Every victory that he went into and gave his life to was for the benefit of Saul. Can you imagine working for somebody and everything you're doing is to be a blessing to them the whole time they're trying to beat you down, pull you down, take you down? I wish I had five of y'all that would understand that, that David was loyal to Saul to a fault. A fine loyalty like that no more. The Bible says for a piece of bread a man will transgress. You don't look out for you no more. I won't be kind to you no more. Right, right, right. And the only thing that saved David's life, bless the Lord, was Jonathan's love for him that surpassed the love of a woman. Yeah. That he had a brother right. and loved him enough to warn him of the wickedness that Saul had planned. Yes, you got to understand, David had seen how good God could be to some individual that did not deserve it, had not earned it, based upon merit. He had not got to the place where he deserved the grace and mercy that had been shown unto him, but David had experienced it for himself. Amen. The Bible said, David sent messages down, verse 5, to Jabesh Gilead and said, Blessed be ye of the Lord. He recognized and anybody that could be kind to somebody who was mean had to have a particular slant at heart. Anybody who could overlook the transgressions and see the truth about somebody, even though they were acting bad. Can I just interrupt my sermon for a moment and say, remember this, when people treat you bad, it's not because you how you treated them, but because of some ill or ill inside of them that has been left untreated. Talk to you, I don't think they heard what you said. When people are mean and nasty and evil and wicked to you, it's not because of anything you've done to them. It's because they have something that needs to be treated inside of them uh, that still ills and ails them. Uh, if you have somebody who's always negative, uh, always nasty, always cruel, uh, can't say nothing nice to nobody no time, uh, it's not because of anything you did to them, uh, but because there's something inside of them that's hurting uh, and has not been healed, somebody uh, ought to say amen. Let me help y'all here. There is no one walking God's green earth uh, that woke up this morning uh, that has a right, come on now, to be mean to everybody for the rest of this day. But if God woke you up, you are doing better than 7,000 people that are going to die this day in the United States of America. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. He woke you up. Amen. He woke you up. 7,000 people in America are going to die today. He woke you up. Thank you, Lord. So, since speaking, every day 7,000 people leave this earth just in America. And you have the nerve with all that breath in your body, with all that beauty on your face, to choose to use a frown as your ornamentation rather than adorn yourself with a smile. As good as God has been to you. There are 60,000 people on Skid Row in California, in Los Angeles, and you woke up this morning in a bed with a roof over your head, and you're going to be angry and mad and not say good morning to somebody. I don't care how much it hurts. I don't care what pain you're going through. Something inside you want to say, I can do better. Let me tell you what the greatest medicine you'll ever find. Joy. Amen. Amen. Ain't, ain't no medicine like joy. Amen. Or the, or the pharma, trust me, if the pharmaceutical companies could box it and sell it, oh, they would, it would be out there. Ain't nothing like joy. 
And let me tell you one more time. Hope. God, come on now. Hope ain't nothing like hope. Ain't nothing like hope. You put some joy and some hope together. Uh-oh. Don't, don't put no love on it. Don't couple it with no peace. I'm trying to give you a formula right here. You put hope on it. Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yes. Amen. But when you got hope, oh, yes. it'll heal what your heart has been hurt for. Yes. Something about hope help you. I listen, listen, listen. The Bible says David told the men of Jabesh Gilead, he said, you have been blessed of the Lord because you show kindness unto the Lord that had been wicked over us. You show kindness to someone who was cruel. You've got to be blessed by God because it takes somebody who's been blessed by God to show kindness to people that are cruel. Well, Y'all didn't hear me. Everybody can't show kindness to people that are cruel. You got to be blessed of God. You got to be anointed by the Almighty to turn around and blow bubbles at somebody who's shooting bullets at you. Why aren't y'all? Bible says, bless. Bless and curse not. That this is what Bible said. Be good unto them that despitefully use you. If they slap you on one cheek, turn to them the other cheek. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Be angry, but sin not. Come on. I say, uh oh, hold on. I might not be as blessed as I think I am. Because our definition of blessing is what's parked in the parking lot. Our definition of blessing is how many rooms our house can hold. Our definition of blessing is how many commas are in our bank account. Our definition of blessing is how fine your wife is, how good looking your husband is, y'all. And he's saying how, how well your children are. Our definition of blessing, it pales in comparison. David said, for you to show that kind of kindness to the house of the Lord, that even your Lord saw, means God had had to have blessed y'all with a totally different perspective. One of my favorite memes when I was still on social media was, uh, you cannot amen uh, uh, trouble somebody who's at peace because they will okay you to death. Uh, y'all, y'all, I, 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 I like that. When you know you're settled in your spirit, uh, you ain't got to give nobody a piece of your mind because you are at peace of mind with yourself. I, I ain't got to tell you all because I'm too good, amen, too busy telling myself how good God has been to me. I, I ain't got time to argue with you over that. Oh, you want to paint it blue, it looks pink, but let's go ahead and paint it your color blue. Because uh, it ain't going to bother you, ain't going to rattle me. Uh, I ain't going to lose my composure. Somebody ought to say amen in here. I'm not going to let anything disturb my peace. Uh, for the Bible says he will keep you in perfect peace uh, if you keep your mind stayed on him. Uh, somebody say, hey, don't, don't let that stuff bother you. Don't let that stuff bother you. God said to tell Omega. Your kindness is getting ready to come back. Everything. Hey, it's me, Pastor Jason Clark of Omega Baptist Church Ministries, inviting you to join me every Sunday, 8 a.m., 10 a.m. at Omega Baptist Church in Owings Mills. Come on out and have a great time with us. 44, 24 Paynton Road. You'll have a great time. God bless. Welcome back. Hope you've enjoyed the program this morning. Can you believe it? Autumn is here, first week of October. Start setting our sights for the holidays and the new year, and we're going to be talking to you about the new year, hopefully to prick your conscience and make you think about some things that you need to address for the new year to make it the best year ever. That's our prayer for you and yours. Listen, we're on our way out, but as always, in parting, remember to walk in His grace and live in His glory. We'll see you next week right here on Grace and Glory. I can say that you're beautiful. But to me, you are so much more. How do I communicate exactly who you are? I'm trying to convey the sentiment of my
my heart and say I really do appreciate the way you brighten up my day. I can't find the words to describe you. It would take a million years. It would take a million years to explain. down the line and name all the things that captivate my heart but clearly I'm not aware of words that can compare 